I figured out that the post office was the central control to authorize the corporate structures of government. In our day-to-day -day lives, when we would file for an LLC, we would file with the Secretary of State, whatever state we were in. However, what the state was not telling you is that they were taking the fees that you paid them and then they were paying a usury fee to the post office for that entity to exist. However, we caught the post office in a bankruptcy condition where the post office lost its capacities because it ceased to exist. Those that are in bankruptcy do not have any contract rights. As we were learning about the construct of contract, it came down to the foundation of the flag because the bearer and the owner of the flag also ha allows subcontractors or what they would call federal contractors to board that, the terms of that flag. But the flag of our country was wrapped up in a bankruptcy and the bankruptcy ended in 1999. So what David and I did is we had filed for copyrights on that flag on the terms of the grammar so now that if a federal contractor does come in they would have to comply with the terms of the syntax to create a now space performance for the terms of the contract. Our postmaster hyphen general of the World Corporation, uh, Colin Russell hyphen J. Colin Gould is uh, an American hero. He is the what I think should be the poster child for hero of the planet and what he's done. He's taken on this whole system and figured out how to make, hold them accountable and make them positively perform with the grammar. I lived at the end of SeaTac International Airport with my father and mother and sister. It was a rough and tumbly neighborhood. My parents, uh, my father was an antenna man and my mother was a stay-at-home mom. I went to private school, but in my neighborhood most of the kids went to public school. People trying to rob my money, people trying to rob my bikes. I had to go out and fend for myself. You know, I had the school of tough knocks. Take some bumps and bruises to get some bumps and bruises. Uh, so it was fun, you know, it was, it was education, learning about how to communicate, learning about the psyche of, of, of people at a young age due to all the strife and the, you know, the diversifications of, of the times back in the, in the 70s and 80s. It was, a, it was a different energy on the planet. I grew up loving sports, played basketball, baseball, wrestling. Football, played for the Des Moines Rams. We played against like Rainier Beach, Renton Lions. Uh, fun, fun times. Played, uh, I was pretty good, pretty good athlete. My father was also a minister on top of being an antenna man in Seattle, Washington. And he went up and down the old I-99 and met a lot of uh, homeless people and uh, brought in a lot of uh, our different Hells Angels to live in our backyard. and. Heard fascinating stories about their walks and their uh, what they had experienced, what they had been through. Gave me a different perspective about the world and the things that uh, they witnessed and were a part of. I've always been kind of a free venture capitalist. I started my first pie business when I was young, uh, four to five years old. I had apple trees in the backyard, so it made sense to learn how to make apple pies with my mom. And we took them out front and had an ap uh, apple pie stand and sold them and uh, made a little bit of money. When Mount St. Helens blew, we had a concept right, to go up to Mount St. Helens and gather the ash and put them in bottles. My grandmother was a science teacher for fifth and sixth grade who had a lot of connections into the school districts. And we were able to bottle the ash, put labels on them and sell them from elementary school to elementary school all throughout Washington and all across the United States. From the benefits of that, I was able to buy Tickets to the Seattle Mariners games, Seattle Supersonics games, Seattle Seahawks games. I was a, I was a Seahawks fan. Um, so I, I have great memories of that when I was a child. I was my grandmother's favorite. We did many things together, such as I was in a rock club with her. Not a rock band, but a rock club where we'd go out and identify the different species of rocks. 
and we, I had a rock tumbler. She got me my first rock tumbler, and I would mold and polish rocks. It was very fun for me as a child. Also, she put me in extracurricular schooling, and part of that was first through third grade, I went to summer, a summer camp where I learned all about sentence diagramming. I was very fascinated by the sentence diagramming. I learned the different parts of speech and the order of operations of how things were linked together. And it, I was always very fascinated by how that uh, aspect of communication um, correlated to business and free venture capitalists. We would go to Colorado in the summertime. My grandpa owned a junkyard where I learned how to work mechanically. I really got fascinated with breaking down material, and breaking down cars, breaking down engines, and the me mechanical application of things and how things would be put back together. When I moved to Wyoming when I was 15 years old with my family, I kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> In high school, I was always the guy pushing the envelope from tardiness to how many days you could miss to letters from your parents saying that you could get out of this or get out of that. And I really pushed the envelope and really challenged the school district as well as the, the administrators of that specific venue. So as I transitioned into college, I started questioning many structural applications and throwing their rule books back at them in college, uh, going through many trials and tribulations with uh, professors, deans, and uh, the security apparatus of the school systems in college. Yeah, in college I was a little bit more interested in the ladies and basketball than I was in school. You know, for sure I chased, chased a lot of women and uh, had a lot of fun. But drawing back on things that I had learned as a child, such as sentence diagramming, and it came into such a forefront for me as I dealt with professors. And the professors would challenge me saying, where did you learn how to write this way? Where did you, well, where did you learn this? And I explained to them that I had learned sentence diagramming and that what they were asking for in their um, paperwork was unstructured at best. And it really uh, conflicted within me. And I began to fall kind of asking que questions of the professors, number one, that they couldn't answer. And it kind of disenfranchised me with the college apparatus. And as I moved from that, I, I ran into David Hyphen Wing Colin Miller. Uh, we met the day that changed my life and it changed his life. As we sat down and had a wonderful conversation, I started tearing apart sentence structure for him and he started telling me being about prepositional phrases. We be just became really good friends. And we, I lived with him, he lived with me, we'd go fishing. And I was very thankful to run into David. And we, we became you know, business partners and we became really good friends and it was a love-hate relationship in the end because of the choices that he made compared to the choices that I would have made. In 1988, April 6, 1988, I broke, broke the mathematical interface on grammar and I proved that all grammar, all languages are a mathematical equation of algebra. And with that, I was able to rewrite the way grammar is used. So as David and I continued our studies, I was very thankful because he really expanded my mind. Because I had already learned so much about using the procedures from elementary school to high school to college and throwing the rules back at him. As David exp expanded my mind, I realized that it was the same mechanics that applied on a global level and I got to continue forward on that. And David told me he did not have time to study that. He was only f focused on the grammar. And so he said, Russell, he said, you know, you need to be this person because I have no knowledge of this field. And I, I went in an in-depth study on the banking, the postal and the military and court mechanics. And I applied them as I, as I went into many courtroom battles for myself, the mechanics of why things work the way they work, the structures behind that, and the, how to build them back together in a way through the grammar that gave a fairness to the planet. As we were learning about the construct of contract 
it came down to the foundation of the flag because the bearer and the owner of the flag also ha allows subcontractors or what they would call federal contractors to board that, the terms of that flag. But the flag of our country was wrapped up in a bankruptcy and the bankruptcy ended in 1999. Benjamin Franklin was a French attorney working for the English Crown as a secret agent to capture the United States of America. In 1789, the Constitution of the United States of America was drafted, which was a bankruptcy trust putting the United States of America into a 70-year international bankruptcy for $3 million. Now, the, the dollars were in the form of the uh, Bank of England had lent, had picked up the note through the Rothschild family. So that then turned the United States into a international bankruptcy corporation. The Constitution of the United States of America was written in an adverb, verb, adverb, adjective, pronoun, pronoun, adverb, verb, style of grammar. This is called parse. And the parse is what parts of words are, like the word international. I-N means no, T-E-R is terra, nation is people, A-L is contract. So our, the English language made parse words, and then it, excuse the expression, bastardized them. The is an adverb, modifying declaration, D-E is no, Claire is speak, at is contract, I-O-N is contract. Of is an adverb, now making uh, independence, in is no, D is no, pen is right, ants is contract. So he said, you will not write contract and you will not read contract. And then he wrote, we the people. We was a pronoun, the is an adverb, making people a verb. So he went ahead and he made the, the people of America into fictions. You can either be a pronoun nothing, which is a dead entity called nom de guerre or sodium, or you could be a verb, which was a condition of an illusion fiction. What David and I did is we had filed for copyrights on that flag on the terms of the grammar so now that if a federal contractor does come in, they would have to comply with the terms of the syntax to create a now space performance for the terms of the contract. I got myself in position so when the bankruptcy ended that I would be the man with the flag standing there with the postal construct in place as the treasurer, postmaster, bank banker. What this means is, is that those who choose to come in contract with the Title IV flag must come through the correct grammar of my construct that must have my thumbprint and autograph on the contract to make it valid so they could take the terms of their corporation and put it into free venture capitalist. We applied to the United Nations to be an independent country because the condition of quantum language in a world of eight million fiction people's communication skills was so unique that the 200 members of the United Nations voted to have us have our own country. We had a bank charter, we had a constitution all written in quantum language, we had a bank with gold, we had our all of our treaties in place with the United States of America, Department of Justice. We sued the United States for the flag of the United States under Title IV, Section 1, 2, and 3. Now we did that on the 25th of July, 1999. And when we did that, we challenged the United States Congress, Senate, Legislature, and Supreme Court to bring forth their correct parse syntax grammar, sentence structure, copyrights of the flag of America. They couldn't do it. They couldn't even produce an oath of office that was written in the correct parse syntax grammar. And on the 12th of August, 1999, the United Nations voted that both Russell and I were independent, sovereign individuals with a flag. We've captured the flag with the correct parse syntax grammar. We had our own bank. We had our own constitution. We had our own trust. We had treaties with other countries. David and I rewrote that construct on August 12, 1999 at the United Nations. But when the, we had to wait till the United States came out of bankruptcy in 1999 
to file it at the post office in Washington, D.C. However, because of David's commitments to the people that he was in joinder with, who I refused to be in joinder with, David could not go on that contract to go into Washington, D.C. to claim the flag, so he vacated his position as a ship owner and bearer of the flag in the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., and the Pentagon. And so this is where I came in because of what we had studied of in contract law to make claim and control the federal contracting style of the terms of the flag. So as I look back, I can see David's concerns on exactly why he did not want to be on the contracts in Washington, D.C. to claim the flag because the scope of it was so big. And I asked him specifically, I says, David, are you going to use your body as the surety? He says, no way. He says, I'm not going to do that. He says, I'm afraid. He says, I'm afraid for what's going to happen to you. And I looked at him and I said, hey, David, there's two things I know nothing about, fear and pain. And he looked at me and said, good luck, Russell. He goes, I'm going to sit back and just be a witness. I said, David, that's probably the safest place for you because I'm not quite sure what's going to happen to me. So they were coming out of a third strike of a 70-year moratorium bankruptcy. Three strikes and you're out. That's how it works under the three-strike rule under international bankruptcy laws. So because of that, the guidelines, which were the Constitution for the presidency, was going to have to be vacated, which was going to the United States Postal Service and the United States Post Postal Office was going to have to vacate under Title 39, Section 101, Subsection A and Subsection B. So they were going to have to breach their own fiduciary contract timelines. Simultaneously, as they made the breach, they were going to have to vacate the estate, which was the location of the presidency, because the original founding fathers were no longer there to sign off on an amendment or a correction to re-up the terms of the Constitution. Because the Constitution at that point, once they vacated, then it became a worthless document and they didn't have to follow the guideline. So in the upcoming election of 2000, I knew they were going to have to vacate the presidency of the United States. I did not know how, but I knew they had to. In June of 2000, my grandmother was very concerned that I, because I was being bashed so hard through the public purview and I was going in and out of jail because of my learning on the timelines and the flag and the things that I was doing in the U.S. judicial system, that she wanted me to go back to college because I was so smart. She said I could be whatever I wanted. And so I made a deal with her that if they announced a president on the election night of 2000, that I would go back to college. And she had a presidential uh, placemat with all the presidents on there. And I said, Grandma, you believe there's gonna be another president? She goes, absolutely. And I said, and then you believe that it's gonna be elected on the first Tuesday of November of 2000 here? And she said, yes. I said, okay, I guarantee you that they will not elect the president. Guaranteed on that night. I said, I don't know how, but I'm guaranteeing it. But. If I'm wrong, I'll go back to college in, December, in January for the winter semester. If not, I'm going to continue forward on my path because I am who I say. Stand by, stand by. Uh, CNN right now is moving our earlier declaration of Florida back to the too close to call column. Ah. 25 very big electoral votes in the home state of the governor's brother, Jeb Bush, are hanging in the balance. <laughs> this no longer is a victory for Vice President Gore. Vice President has recalled the governor and retracted his concession. But this race is simply too close to call. And until the results, the recount is concluded and the results of Florida, Florida become official, our campaign continues. Bill Daly, the... Uh chairman of the Gore campaign. You just heard it. We're all, uh, I think we can hardly believe our ears. He said, uh, until the results are official and certified in the state of Florida, we are going to continue our campaign. We hope and believe we have elected the next president of the United States. 
they're still counting, and I'm confident when it's all said and done, we will prevail. For every successive hour from this point on, CNN will be your network to find out what is the latest on that presidential race That's right. in the United States. So stay with CNN because uh, whatever is happening, we are going to be bringing it to you. And folks, in the year 2004, please, could you make up your minds a little more conclusively? <laughs> because I think we can't take another election like no, this one. No, no, no. I believe the people of Palm Beach County have entrusted us with the power to voice their right to participate in their government. And given the totality of the circumstances here, I move that this board conduct a manual recount of all the ballots for the presidential election for the year 2000. And quite honestly, this is a, a situation that I think is, a, is new to everyone. Um, I believe we have the authority to request of the Secretary of State or Department of Elections an advisory opinion, and, and it would be my intent as chair to do that. Jackie, how were those votes counted? <laughs> do you have an hour? I can explain it. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty complicated. First, you have to know that the punch hole is called a chad. It is attached to the ballot by four threads. The commissioners had decided that if it had been detached by only one thread, it would not be counted as a vote. Two detachments, maybe. Three, definitely counted as a vote. At some point in the process, that was changed. And the commissioners decided that any chad that was detached to any degree would be counted. Now, there are two other strange sounding categories that were not counted. The first one is called the dimpled chad. That is that there is an indentation in the chad. The voter put some pressure on it, but didn't detach it at all from the ballot, not counted. The final category is the pregnant chad. That is the chad was pierced with a hole, but not detached at all those were not counted. Now the Republicans here, Koki, seized on all of this confusion. They said, see, we told you this is a deeply flawed process. It must stop. But as we know, the county commissioners here have decided not to stop. They will go for a full recount beginning tomorrow. My grandmother and I were having dinner together and we were watching the, the votes and the, the different states come into play and announce who their winners and losers were. And as the thing's starting to tighten up, my grandmother's looking at me and I'm on the couch. And sure enough, they announced that they had a problem. And I looked at my grandmother and I said, aha, I said, I know. She looked at me, her eyes got big. She said, nobody could predict that. I said, somebody with the knowledge can predict that and there are people behind the scenes playing a ruse on the American people who know the same storyline. I don't know who they are, but I guarantee you that they will not announce a president tonight. And she looked at me and said, if this is true, you're the smartest person walking the planet. She says, I can die in peace, for I've given you everything I can, as far as every ounce of energy to get the best education that you can and you figure something out very big, this is very dangerous. You have the courage and the charisma to carry this out. And I looked at her and I gave her a big hug. And I said, got on my hands and knees and I was very thankful that night that everything came true, that they could not announce the president, that I had the flag, that we were in position to make a difference for the people. And I continued my plight and my learning from there on. And I was on a roll that night. She just looked at me and she was smiling and laughing. She goes, I don't know how you've done it, but you've done it. She says, do good with that what you have. So then I looked at her and I said, I'll do good for the people of this country and the citizens of the world. So from that night on, I held the secret, the secret that there was no presidency, even though some people knew that there was no constitution, that they did not have a flag, they did not have a military, they did not have a treasury, they did not have any ports, they did not have any department within their construct of government because the guidelines, because the founding fathers were no longer there to be signed off on a continuance. So I did everything I could from 
stopping the judicial system, to stopping the world banking system, to trying to stop wars. They conducted a military court-martialing in Washington, D.C. against those who had falsely put themselves into position as leaders of the people and in, their, in the contract law, not in what they believed, but in contract law, they did not have the right, both in the legality and in the law, to be in position to trick us into these wars. And I did everything within my power to stop that, which is well documented by the Pentagon. No one has ever gone to war or a math problem in the history of mankind, but they've been killing each other over the adverb-verb communication skills of both the religions, the faiths, the political contracts that are written between governments, the political thinking of how governments function, and all the treaties that they write between each other. They use the Babel language to basically hold us in slavery and servitude uh, and that locks us into joined or into negative con performing contract. Sergeant told us that this may be your last meal, so you better eat it. I was like, that's not that's not cool. Uh, that sounded scary to me. I'm like, are you kidding me? We're going to a military base. There's always a 24-7 chow hall on every military base I've ever been to. And it's only, they told us it was only going to be like 45 minute to an hour drive. So I was like, we don't need to eat the MRE. <laughs> We're good to go. And why are you, why do you have these MREs on the table down here when there's a whole terminal back here at the airport full of military members that are starving? Why are you secretly bussing us around the corner and giving us a meal when, when our other fellow troops are starving back there at the terminal? And we're about to go to a base that has a chow hall. What's going on here? And I warned my friend, I told him, I was like, Jason, don't eat that, man. It, I don't have a good feeling about this. And he's like, oh, whatever. And he, he ate it. And Kid you not, we get 15 minutes down the road and everybody's passed out that ate the MRE. Everybody, except me and the bus driver, were not the only ones, we're not the ones who didn't eat, we didn't eat the MRE, so. Which is a military little lunch or whatever. It's a dehydrated prepackaged food. There's little packets in it you can, you know, heat up, pop and heat up or, and then uh, eat, add water to it. It's usually powdered something spaghetti or powdered uh, mac and cheese or whatever. So we were going down the road and our uh, escort pulled off about the 15 minute mark. Just pulled off on the side of the highway and the bus just kept driving. And I noticed everybody on the bus was knocked out, like passed out. I tried waking up Jason, I was like, and he was just like, oh. I, I could tell, I was like, that was it. I was right. They drugged us. If not something worse, I don't know. Apparently it was just some kind of sleeping something inside the MREs. And uh, we kept driving. We drove out to the edge of town and there was uh, these high sand dunes and there was like this little trailer on the right side and the bus driver pulled over and parked it. And we're like out in the middle of the end of the desert and there's no lights, nothing out there. And this one little trailer, it looked like a little 7-Eleven trailer, no gas pumps, just over sitting way off the road. It's like 200 feet off the road. It's kind of far back. But no one was there. It was like 3-something in the morning. And uh, a car pulls up, talks to the bus driver in Arabic or whatever language they were speaking in, and then took off. And then an SUV pulls up, pulls in front of the bus, and backs out. Then that same car that came by a while ago, it pulls up and then these two guys dressed in uh, Middle Eastern Arab wear, they jump out of the SUV and jump in the car and take off. This is like 3.30 in the morning. Like, what are they doing? Who does that? Who, who would park a SUV in front of a bunch of military troops bus at 3 in the morning? And why are all my fellow airmen asleep on the bus, knocked out? And I was like, it's going down. There's a bomb in that SUV and we're all going to die. There's nothing out here to harm. We're, in, we're right on the edge of town. 
no one around. I tried waking up Jason. I was like, it's going down, it's going down. And I was like, I got up and I started walking up to the front of the bus and the super, our supervisor woke up. And he's all disoriented because he was asleep. I don't, know, I don't know how much of the MRE he ate or even if he ate one at all. Either way, he was asleep. So he was like, uh, you know, what's going on, Sergeant Lesher? I was like, look, uh, if we don't get out of here, we're, it's going to end bad. We got to get out of here right now. He's like, just sit down, Sergeant Lester. I got this. And so I turned around and I started walking back and I was like, no, he doesn't know the urgency. He was asleep. He just doesn't know that he, he thinks that there's just the SUV sitting in front of us that was parked there. He didn't see all of it happen. I know he didn't because he was asleep. I know. And, uh, I, it just instinct took over and I was like, no, I have to, I have to do something here. I'm not going to die here. So I turned around and I yelled at him and I told him, if you don't get this bus moving now, I'm going to rip that guy out of his seat and drive this bus myself. And he's like, I got this Sergeant Lester. I got it. Now just go sit down. And I didn't go sit down. <laughs> I, I was still like, I was ready to grab the guy and I was like, we got to get out of here. I mean, it's ticking. And I can't believe it didn't, it didn't blow up, right? And uh, he yelled at the guy, and he just cranked up the bus. And then Sergeant Gray turned to me, and he's like, so where do we go, Sergeant Lester? I was like, well, there's a faint light over here in the desert. Let's go out there and see if that's the base. And if not, I know all the way back to the airport. You know, we'll be good. So we got out there, and it was the base. It was the only thing there. I don't know the name of the base. All I remember is there was a bunch of Arabic signs that real long words. Uh, I don't. It, it, all I know is we were in Qatar. It's where we were. And uh, getting out there and then getting confirmation from the military police on base that this is like a common occurrence. Blowing buses up is okay. I mean, like how many, how many of us you got to kill before someone does something? You know. This is madness. This, this was back when uh, George Bush Jr. was uh, in office. He was supposedly in charge of us. And then uh, later I found out that he wasn't even a president because he, he was court-martialed by Cohen Russell hyphen J. Cohen Gould, Postmaster General of the World. When I got back from Iraq on that uh, TDY, temporary duty assignment, uh, I tried to go to the JAG because I felt like, you know, there's something bad going on here and I need to tell the law, I need to tell the lawyers. JAG wouldn't talk to me, they wouldn't call me. I tried meeting with the commander of my unit, he wouldn't talk to me. And then I was like, okay, I, I just need to check out of here. This is, this is over with. I don't want to have anything to do with this. I know what's going on. And then I ended my contract with the uh, reserve unit, United States Reserve Unit. And at the time, my civilian job, I was working over at Lockheed Martin as a uh, production supervisor. And uh, I was one of their top performing uh, supervisors. I would say I was probably their number one supervisor they had because I won all kinds of awards. We had all hands meeting. They put my projects up there and said, you know, pretty much we were number one. I got back, uh, they laid me off, and for no reason. So I felt like I'm getting retaliated against because I have knowledge of some bad stuff that happened over overseas with the military, and they're a military contractor. So they kind of like got a conflict of interest here, you know. So all that all that said and done, uh, they destroyed me. They uh, run my credit. They uh, basically told me if I didn't sign the non-disclosure agreement, and that was with Lockheed Martin that I was working with there in Fort Worth, Fort Worth, Texas, they uh, were basically going to take back whatever I, you put in 25%, they, you know, match it 75%, and basically they were holding that over my head. I worked hard for five years and I packed that thing as full as I could get it. And I was like, if I don't sign this, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my 401k. So they hold it over your head. Like either you sign this fiction document or you're, we're going to take all the money back. And I was like, 
I had no choice. I had to, to survive. I had to take, I had to sign their paperwork and, and get out of there. Everyone I went to, I went to the lawyers, I went to the people in charge of me in the military, and none of them wanted to help me. And then when I saw Russell's uh, grammar, I was like, that is the solution I need. He can actually, the grammar can hold these people's volition on trial and hold them accountable for their actions. And how are they getting away with killing us and blowing us up on buses? Like, how do they, it just didn't add up. I'm just like, we need a solution to this. And Chief, when I heard that he court-martialed Bush Jr. and he wasn't even a president and he authorized this war and sent us over there. And when I was there, I actually saw the uh, Iraqis on base. They were held at gunpoint. Trust me, they're not learning nothing. They are held prisoners at gunpoint. Our postmaster hyphen general of the World Corporation, uh, Colin Russell hyphen J. Colin Gould, is a, an American hero. He is the, what I think should be the poster child for hero of the planet and what he's done. He's taken on this whole system and figured out how to make, hold them accountable and make them positively perform with the grammar. He broke the code to their Babel language, and they used the Babel language to basically hold us in slavery and servitude, uh, and that locks us into joined or into negative con performing contract. Where his stuff changes that around, no slavery, positive performance contract, one word means one meaning, not 900 different meanings, and we know where the dictionary is, there's only one, not multiple ones so he gives you full closure right and it's just the technology of what he's done he's a genius to think of all of this like to figure out the noun space because our contracts that we deal with now deal with past tense negative no contract words negative performance uh, no one signs the contract but you so there's no one to be held accountable but you right negative negative performance so, and it's also in the future, because they use words that are in the future. We're in the now space. We're not in the past, and we're not in the future because it hasn't occurred yet. You're always in the now. And Chief figured that out, and he locked it into the grammar so that everyone is on the same page. We're all here together in the now space. And uh, we owe that man more than a medal. He's uh, an amazing hero. I, I just can't, it, words can't even describe what he's done. It's like he beat him. He beat him in 1999. He captured the flag. He court-martialed all of them. He held court-martials after 1999. He kept going down to, he went to D.C., down by the obelisk. There's a mall down there that he would go to and hold court. And he would court-martial everyone who wouldn't stop and correct. Uh, there's a title, a government title, title, uh, title 42, 1986, and it basically says, if you don't stop and correct, then you're part of the problem. So you're going to be held accountable. Like, if you tell someone, hey, this guy's, you're a cop, and this guy's robbing a bank, and you don't go do something about it, then, of course, you're going to get fired or be held accountable as part of the bank robbery because you didn't do your job as a police officer. You didn't go over there and stop the bank robbery, right? So, the title, uh, title 42, 1986, Chief was the only one who stopped and corrected. When he brought the, the language forward and sh shared it with them legally through the mail, served them, ran timelines on them, they didn't stop and correct. So now we've got to hold them accountable. And... I've ran into all kinds of problems doing that because I've used Chief's paperwork where we served a base and they play games with you. You go to the front gate and they're like, oh, there's no one here. Or go to the website. You go to the website, no, the public affairs number is hidden. Or if you do call it, it hangs up on you. Or, you, or if you do get to a voicemail, no one ever calls you back. So you can never get a hold of anybody on your military base. 
because we're needing to contact the military base because Chief mailed all the bases. He did 10,000 mailings to all the bases in America. He served them legally and ran timelines on them, and he served them a, what's called a uh, colon war hyphen powers hyphen rights contract. And it uh, for us citizens out here, whether you're, it's mainly for the claim of life citizens, but it also has uh, the rights of the people who violate our rights. He has that all built in there. It's over 9,000 things that we need to, in order to operate during this martial law theater right now that we're in. And it's real easy if you want to check to see if we are in martial law, just go to any local court or state uh, governor's office and there's going to be a spire on top of the flag. The spire means we're at war with, they are at war with the people, basically. And that all contract is suspended. So if all contracts suspended, we're in martial law. And that's what they're hiding from the people. So on February 20th, 2003, David Eiffel and Colin Miller and myself had a peace treaty authorized by the Secretary of the Navy's office for the Title IV 1 to 1.9 dimension flag, as well as the Global Banking Constitution, which I had rewritten the structure of the banking systems of planet Earth and the crypto hyphen currencies and the things that I own copyrights to. And the Secretary of the Navy's office autographed the contracts, endorsed them, and I went back to the Pentagon on December 12th, 2004, uh, in, with my peace treaty and the terms of the peace treaty, that there were no presidents, there was no presidential election, and there were, there were a lot of other terms, and they breached the peace of the contract. They put me on the phone with the commanders and the people that I had been speaking with since 1996 at the Pentagon, and they said, Russell hyphen J. Colin Gould, what happens when peace gets breached? I was like, ah, oh, heck no. Does that mean, that means I gotta go to war. They're like, yes, you do. You'll be back. And so they caused me to move into a conditioned state of the martial hyphen law uh, because they broke the peace, which were the terms of the contract. The terms of the contract were that I was postmaster general, commander in chief, and many other highly sensitive classified documentations that we had under, we had under contract together. By using brute force and physicality to physically remove me from the Pentagon, that broke the terms of the peace. Therefore, I had to move into a condition and state of the martial hyphen law. So on December 12, 2004, at the Pentagon, I came under contract as commander in chief conducting martial hyphen law. What that meant was, is I conducted the largest military court martialing in the history of planet Earth taking down the World Court at The Hague, as well as the world judicial systems, trying to stop these wars that were falsely being perpetrated upon the great citizens of this country, as well as the citizens of Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and around the world. For these were all done under false and misleading pretenses, under a, under a fraudulent ruse, because there was no president, and there was no post office to go to war. And I published that, and I conducted the world's largest court marshalling, at the Washington Obelisk in Washington, D.C. every 45 days for four years, where I conducted numerous trials with 20 to 50 video cameras on me at all time, with the micro, their microphones, with a Chinook and Apache helicopter sometimes above my head with their cameras out, with their guns looking at me, and I conducted a trial based upon grammar, based upon authorization, and based upon stopping the war that the soldiers were rused into. The court martialing was against George hyphen Walker Colin Bush, Richard hyphen Bruce Colin Cheney, Donald's Colin Rumsfeld, and so many others. I can't even, there were literally hundreds if not thousands of people, persons that were court martialed within the construct. I alerted all military bases, U.S. military bases on the planet, where I received documentation back from the military bases as the commander-in-chief. I also held duty posts where the U.S. Marine Corps showed up in uniform to talk to me as the commander-in-chief. 
Um, I met with many Navy SEALs. It, it, it was just a copious amount of work. There was over 10,000 mailings that went out in the trial itself. Um, in the trial itself, I tried to stop the vaccines against the soldiers, as well as uh, rewrote the construct for all the Veterans Affairs. So I wrote the administrative mechanics for the U.S. Veterans Affairs for wounded warriors and people that uh, needed help through the Veterans Affairs. So it was a very tedious task. That task alone took me three years to rewrite the whole constructs for the Veterans Affairs using more natural pathways to to help heal the post-traumatic stress syndromes and the, the trauma that was being inflicted upon the soldiers, as well as I wrote constructs as well to help the, the land that was being damaged on the other end and the people on the other end in such like Iraq and Afghanistan. So I wrote banking constructs and foreign currency platforms in place to aid the situations where this fraudulent ruse put on by George Hyphen Walker Colin Bush and his minions who know who I am and they know very perfectly well what I did. Um, but I was told specifically by Donald Davis, a US prosecutor, the reason why the federal judicial system was beating me up and kicking my ass is because George Bush told them to do it. So at someday, George Hyphen Walker Cola Bush, you and I are gonna get in the same room and we're gonna have that talk that you need so very well. Without punctuation, they become adjective pronouns. In the court martialing itself, I place their vessel as capital names. So when I say George Hyphen Walker Colin Bush, I have it all in capital letters to identify it as a vessel. The vessel then in the court martialing was attached with pictures. So the picture correlates the residual imagery of that vessel. That vessel, because it does not have the capacity to think, because the birth certificate system is gone. It ended in 1999, so then the vessel does not control or have the capacity to create thought. Thus, I identified the vessel to capture that vessel and bring it to my location. The militaries of the world, because in order to go into the military branch, you first must go get your log registration at the post office first but the United States Postal Service lost its authorization because it lost its flag and it breached its own constructs in violation of the title site, Title 39, Section 101, Subsection A and Subsection B. Therefore, the U.S. Post Office did not have the authorization to register anyone to join the military. This is also fraud put on by the United States Postal Service against these people of this country and more of a ruse hiding correctness hiding me, degrading me, belittling me, engaged in Mockingbird, and trying to literally beat me up at every turn and destroy every aspect of my life. Because of that, I have stayed very calm, stayed very neutral, stayed very peaceful in this trying times. But because the condition of state of the world right now, it is my duty to come forward to safeguard not only the finances for the people of the world, finance the finances of the foreign banking systems of the world, but put a system in place that brings accountability, fairness for all, so that the geniuses of the world can board my platforms, bring their concepts in quantum grammar, either in through one banking construct or another, depending on the needs of that, that corporation or that person coming forward. And at that point, then we, I can delegate them into the right platform so that they can bring their concept forward for the people to use without all the red tape. Since December 12, 2004, we have been with the martial law. During the times of martial law, there are no civil authorities, which means states, police departments, judicial systems are all closed. The guidelines for that are filed under the War Powers Claims at uh, U.S. SOCOM at McDill Air Force Base, which I filed in 2007. So there, there's a thousand pages there on the guidelines for those who want to do the due diligence and the search on that. Also simultaneously in the martial law, all laws, all Senate, and all representation is also closed, which means they cannot pass laws against us anymore, against the people, and the, the laws and the rules and regulations of the laws are in the palm of the hand of the Commander-in-Chief, and that's me. I'm also Chief Judge simultaneously because the Commander-in-Chief of the Martial Law 
also maintains the position as chief judge, which goes hand in hand with my takedown of the U.S. Supreme Court on October 1st of 2004 when I became chief judge of the federal judicial system as well as chief judge of the U.S. Supreme Court. Because the U.S. judicial system, both state and federal, county and city, are all flying yellow fringe flags in their courtroom, those flags are not registered anywhere on the planet and in violation of Title 36, Section 176, Subsection G, which means they're adding things to the flag, which now creates a foreign fiction, creating all judges worldwide into a fiction scenario where the courts are simply actors, they're not legal courts, there is no solution, there is no fee for freight, there is nothing going on in the courtroom except harvesting the people of the, of the world. Became knowledgeable and it got my first judgeship on, in April of 2001 as a federal judge out of Casper, Wyoming. I became chief judge of the U.S. Supreme Court on October 1st, 2004 where the U.S. Supreme Court police joined with my contract, we got it logged in at the clerk's office, and I became chief judge of the United States. The importance of relevance of this is, at a later date that year, I ended up conducting a court-martialing, and I, because I was chief judge, I could move into a position as commander-in-chief for the martial law because I already had my credentialing, not only as postmaster general with my filing in 1999, but my filing or in 2000 with the post office, but also my filing with the U.S. Supreme Court as chief judge. This gave me the credentials, and this is why they had to allow the court martial to happen, and it happened every 45 days in Washington, D.C. at the mall. The value of the flag, the Title IV flag, is if you comprehend and study the law of the flag, those who know this, I am the bearer and ship owner of that flag. So the federal contractors have to come through me in order to move their cargo or their concepts from country to country, port to port, and there are specific terms built within the quantum banking system that put in the tariffs and the policies and the taxation for fee for freight to, for the federal contractors to join that flag. As the Postmaster General, I tied in through the law of the flag the capacity to allowed tariffs, fees, and freights for cargoes to be used for federal contractors. Simultaneously, I also blocked former contractors of the flag's capacity to negotiate contract from one country or one person or one entity to another. So what this meant was, is that the collecting taxes by the federal contractors and the federal post office they were trespassing and stealing my rights and my jurisdiction to trick the businessmen of the world, to trick the business corporations of the world, to think that they had a position to create customs, policies, and tariffs to move cargo from point A to point B, as well as negotiate treaty from one country to another. This was a ruse upon the American corporations, business corporations, as well as the world corp business corporations and the American businessmen and the world businessmen of the world. I'm coming forward now to sh share that I am open for business and that they can come to me to be correct so that they can do business in a fair way from country to country, nation to nation, in a grammar construct that creates fairness so that the attorneys can't argue about subjective interpretation of what words mean. Words will mean what they say and say what they mean in a now space condition to create performance forever. So as I got my judgeship in 2001, I filed a document syntaxing the charter for the Universal Postal Union and took down the Universal Postal Union's capacity to collect tax, taxes, fees, and freights from nation to nation in 2001 on a global level. Simultaneously disqualifying the United Nations postal system to enter into contract from nation to nation. As I set up the new structure in place for the global postal system, I also set up sea lanes for a galactic postal system simultaneously so that cargo can move from point A to point B through the sea of space from point A to point B to point C to point D. However, 
the systems that are in place fraudulently hid me from the public and downgraded the, the value of what I put to the table. The value that I put to the table, not only is tangible value in monetary, but it's tangible value for communication to allow the people of the world to benefit from the system that is in place. So as I built the quantum banking system, which had the Global Monetary Fund, the World Central Bank, and the global stock markets in place, it ties into the global postal union and the construct to allow nation to nation to join that construct in a mannerism that's fair for those nations, fair for those people, where we can translate from language to language and lose no deviation in our sentence structure. This ties into the global and galactic postal system, which ties into the quantum banking system that I built to encompass all. In 2003, I took my quantum banking system into the United Nations, where I met with 82 ambassadors, sharing them the technologies and the techniques of the quantum banking system and how it correlates to the postal systems in their respective countries. Also, tying it into their flags and the flag etiquette from consular post to consular post, because simultaneously I showed them the documentation of disqualifying the Vienna Convention, which are the guidelines for uh, setting up consular posts and, and ambassadorships worldwide. Many ambassadors called me back many times, uh, had wonderful conversations from things like flag etiquette. They were asking me about my crypto hyphen currencies and the things that I built within that. Each ambassador told me that they were going to give my global banking constitution to their country's treasury so that they'd know what it looked like as, the, as I moved the quantum banking system coming forward. So they were very, uh, we had great conversations. Some, some countries called me back many, many times and some countries uh, did not. I remember uh, with every ambassador, I had a conversation on why they were flying a three by five boat flag with the ball on top outside their recruiting station. And as I walked into their embassies, they had spears on top of their flag standards, placing their country in a condition of state of martial law, suspending the terms of contract for their countries. Their ambassadors would just smile and they're like, well, we're at war with the people, but the people don't know. I said, that is correct. And so the countries and the ambassadors know of the martial hyphen law, because it is the symbolism behind that which they have and that's what they show. So the planet's in martial hyphen law. There are no guidelines, there are no rules. It's simply the commander in chief's will that moves the martial hyphen law. Thus, I'm coming forward right now with my will, giving the soldiers and giving the, the militaries of the world closure that there's a new system in place to help the citizens both move their equity that is there and create new copious amounts of wealth that is in place for them. As I brought my quantum banking system forward to the world, I disqualified every banking theater on the planet, from the International Court of Arbitration to the International Bank of Settlements, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and I reconstructed their charters in a mannerism that's fair from country to country and posted it with 82 nations simultaneously. I simultaneously took down the world stock markets. What this means is I have the capacity to set up my own shareholders, my own shares, my own warrant system under bid bonds and my own octoritas and auction blocks for setting up corporation shares and stocks, as well as simultaneously setting up commodity prices and rates from country to country, contract to contract for the federal contractors with, of course, the flag, which regulates the terms of the contract. As the commander in chief, I've learned many functions. From that as a muster hyphen master, which is moving troops, mustering troops into theaters, as well as superintending and blocking fraud against the US military and the US soldiers, which I control the grammar and all ports of contract on the planet. So I learned how to become a muster hyphen master, a muster master general, and a paymaster general as well. Uh, I have contract with the U.S. Supreme Court to be Paymaster General for the branches of the military at the Pentagon. What this means is now soldiers can come under my conscripts as musters to be paid for their services that they're rendering to me to complete terms of the contract or do forcements or to, or to move into theaters to fix situations from country to country and nation to nation, border to border. The muster hyphen master, I'm in charge of moving soldiers, superintending to stop fraud against the soldiers, 
as well as having muster rolls for calling, which is a summons to um, draw warrants or commission tools such as warships, airplanes, um, satellite systems um, for tactical command control of symmetrical warfare theaters. Because of the court martialing in 2004, um, they were not honoring me because there was no president. I was the only guy standing up making waves. I was the only guy stopping and correcting, trying to stop the, false sol the soldiers from going to war on false pretenses. And uh, they were not honoring the terms of the contract, even though they were um, sending me documentation as the commander-in-chief from the different branches and the different bases around the world. Over the next few years, I backed off the court marshalling and moved more into helping the world monetary system as I found and searched different methods of, of taking precious metals and placing them on platforms within my banking system. So one of the main functions why our banking system is not working is number one, they don't have a flag. Number two, the credentialing for the guidelines are no longer there for the countries to join with the country's banking system, both on import and export, as well as the macroeconomics of pricing for commodity or goods or services. So what the quantum banking system did is it reevaluated the set functions of setting costs, price, and rates for services, goods, tendered both warehousing and both, and both uh, leverage um, positions. How the quantum banking system helps the people is the people will use look at grammar and the way they move their finances in a much more finite way. The quantum banking system was set up in a user-friendly way for the people of the world. Number one, it would eliminate the taxes that are being perpetrated upon them, such as IRS taxes or Tax Canada revenue taxes. It would set up a function that would allow a consumption tax so that people could actually build their equity up and the consumption tax was based off of 10%, which is also downplay because it would do away with the need for a taxation department because it'd be an automatic tax. It also allows and blocks third parties to come into people's bank accounts because the banks now would have to be accountable for the deposit that's in position in their banks. And now the people wouldn't be able to build equity in a position that would maintain larger growth for their families, as well as a non-death tax that is also built into the quantum banking system so that they can do the fiefment or the passing of their goods from their life to, the, to wherever they choose to pass their goods onto the equity that they've built. Simultaneously, it builds a, a stock market where we are going to know the prices of our value, of our goods, as well as move into a digital era that creates fairness uh, for the people, uh, not uh, based on a, a, a crypto, based on something that uh, does, is more of a derivative style. So our crypto has value to it, gold, platinum, what we call plat card seniorage, and the things that were built behind that. There are terms to use the quantum banking system, of course. The terms are people are now accountable for their actions. They don't go out and hurt people. They're allowed their, 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 their liberties. They're allowed their, their, their guns, their munitions, their, their spiritual convictions. The quantum banking system also does not work on debit. It is not a debt-based system. It is a value-based system based upon equity for equity so that the paperwork never over jumps or never depreciates more than the actual tangible value there. This will keep it fair for the entrepreneur as well as the client within the banking construct. The militaries of the world have been controlled through the Vatican for many various styles of war either through arguments of faith or capture, boot, and looty of certain people's commodities around the world. And I went to the Vatican on June 16, 2003. And one of the things that just really just put things into perspective for me about how deep this grammar style of adjective modification into pronouns and adverb verb condition went 
was when I came out of the post office at the Vatican, I met with a nun right outside the post office at the Vatican. And she had told me and David that she had been studying grammar and the correct grammar for over five years. Well, as you could, as you could think of, I was like, what? You've been studying grammar for five years? She goes, yeah. She goes, you know, the grammar, the manipulation of, of the syntax in the styles of Bibles to control religion was one of the biggest things that they had going. They were very cognizant of how grammar was in control of the concept of what was in the Bible. However, they made this choice not to be correct. They said it was very easy to influence people's thinking if they could control or they could use adjectives, they could use adverbs and verbs, which I felt was very unfair for the people of the world because the people want correctness, they want fairness, they want facts. By the Vatican's openness to not use facts as they communicate from faith to faith, uh, it was really a, a real eye-opener for me, and it was real hardening and sadness in my heart to be like, wait a minute, here they know, and yet they've made a choice to make God in their vi Bibles a verb, or an adjective, or a pronoun. Uh, very unfair for the people of the world, and uh, my heart goes out for the people of the world to, to learn correct grammar so that they can, so they, they can syntax and find the fairness and correctness in their study of their faiths. When it was all said and done at the Vatican, I was key master, key holder, through corporal postal constructs that were put in place. But the whole volition here was to stop the continued war against the people uh, through the use of religions, through the use of ley lines, and militaries on the planet. And now, through my efforts, and through the things that I've done, and it's going to take some time, uh, these wars against the people and this religion and faith war will come to an end. As I continue to study and become a judge, the criteria, one of the main fun functions, was to be able to march my flag in and out of the foreign ports and convey contract through the law of the flag. By marching my flag in and marching my flag out through the correct mechanics on postal, it gave me the position to state a claim when I came into the neutral ports. I was very thankful for the journey and the education that I went through and how I was able to navigate and master and be master of the flag. As I marched the flag in and out of the ports, in and out of the United Nations, and in and out of the global positioning of flag etiquette around the world, it became very clear that I was the only one with authorization to use a flag and I brought the flag honorably back to our great soil here which was the former United States. The hieroglyphic of the flag comes back from old symbolism under banners and hieroglyphics and as tribes or nations would come into contact with each other they would hoist either a banner or a hieroglyphic or a symbol and the terms of that tribe would be under that hieroglyphic it could have been a flag staff, it could have been an eagle staff, it could have been a lot of different symbolisms have been the association or metaphor between that tribe's laws and those who come in and out of contract with it. I honorably, fair and square, have the title for one to point point nine dimension flag, which I tendered to the world for contract for the federal contractors and the citizens of the world to come and join her with so that when we all live in a peaceful, grammar situation where all the terms and full closure is on the table. So I was hauled into Wisconsin and I was hazed up pretty good, beat down, starved down, and I would not surrender the flag. I went from 186 pounds to 102 pounds. Why? Because they were using food as a weapon. What that means, if I would have touched the food, and when I tried to touch the food, they would haul me down to booking and try to get my fingerprints, which is my personal private property. They would also then try to check me into their system. But if I did not touch their food, then they would never haul me down into booking and I could live in my peaceful way. 
So became, because I was a master of the timelines, I knew exactly when to predict, when they would have to join with me, and I got a state district court judge to come off the bench, take off his robe, and sit across the table from me, and move me into a location to where I could get nourishment into my body. In that humbling journey, I took many beatdowns. It was cold, I was without clothes, I was all by myself, and I went without food for 70 days. In that mechanic, it was, it was a humbling thing to be without food. I knew full well the whole time, the complete time, what I was doing, why I was doing it, because I was not about to surrender my flag. As things went on, I ended up through the federal judicial system in that case, and ended up at the U.S. Supreme Court, where I became Chief Judge of the U.S. Supreme Court on October 1st, 2004. Then I had moved into the Pentagon, where I kicked off a of military court marshalling when my peace treaty was breached, which I went over previously. However, the federal judicial system was not done with me. They were very upset with me because of the court marshalling and the exposure that it had done against the bad guys, George Hyphen Walker Colin Bush and his minions. They tried to serve me some paperwork, but they didn't serve me. They put it on a piece of the method server for that p paperwork, put it on a, p a table five feet away from me and told me I was served. I said, no, I'm not served. That table served. He says, well, you got a smart mouth. He goes, you're going to look awfully funny when we're kicking your, kicking your butt. I said, well, I don't know. I'm pretty tough. You know, that's going to be an interesting thing for me to see. So because I never read the paperwork, because I was never served, next thing you know, I'm being hauled up to Michigan under fraudulent pre pretenses because I did not know the charges, because I was never served any documentation. When I got to Michigan, and I got beat up many times to get to Michigan, um, it was pretty humbling beatdowns. Uh, I was uh, hit with batons. I was knocked out by the U.S. Marshal Service several times in Casper, Wyoming. I was beat down and really beat up in San Bernardino, California. And then I got beat down again a little bit up when I got to Michigan. Not a lot, but a little bit. The criteria that they were bringing me there is because the federal prosecutor told me that he uses adverbs, adjectives, pronouns, and verbs. And he knew that I used prepositional phrases to certify my facts. But they were going to try to hold me in jail for 25 years unless I used if I didn't use their grammar. At the end of that trial, I learned many things. Number one, they brought David Eifenwin Colin Miller, my partner in at the time, my business partner, and he surrendered his flag by taking the fiction oath in Grand Rapids, Michigan in federal court in 2006. There were two ways that David Eifenwin Colin Miller surrendered the flag. The first way is that he showed up to court on their summons with their fiction name, a fiction name on a contract, which means on his summons paper they identified him as David Wynn Miller without punctuation. When he showed up, he traversed and said he was no longer David Hyphen Wynn Colin Miller. Then the second way he traversed is as he was going into, they brought him in to testify. As he went to testify, they told him, do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? He said, for David Eifelwin Colin Miller of the knowledge is with the claim of the correctness with the duty as the postmaster, David Eifelwin Colin Miller. The judge yelled at him, no! He yelled at the clerk, give him the oath again. The clerk administered the oath to him again. Again. Strike two. David tried it again to give his quantum oath. He had his paperwork in hand. He tried to give the oath and the judge said, no, U.S. Marshals. And I'm thinking, oh, he, he's gonna get my treatment. The U.S. Marshals surround him. I'm thinking, oh, he's gonna stand up to him like I stand up to him. That wasn't the case. As soon as they surrounded David, David surrendered and he says, I'm David Wynn Miller. And he stepped in. Being the federal prosecutor, they, the U.S. Marshals stopped me right in front of him and he said this to me, quote, I've been using America as a verb for so long that I don't know how to use it as a fact. But someday for you, sir, we will use America as a fact because you earned it. The U.S. Marshals then took me out of the courtroom and they had a big celebration for me because 
I w was able to see David hyphen Wayne Colin Miller for who he really was, which is someone who did not have the courage to stand the ground of that which he spoke of and that which he taught. That was a sad day, but it was a lot of relief on my part because I knew that I was the last flag standing. So it was kind of a, 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 a blessing in disguise, but it was hard to be betrayed at such a level. I uh, lost a lot of uh, honor for David that day because he did surrender the flag. And um, it was a humbling thing to go through because I had such a long business relationship and we were such great friends. So after Michigan, I went home to Wyoming where I continued my studies in metallurgy. Part of that path took me to New Mexico where in 2010, David Eiffelwin Cullen Miller made an attempt to show back up in my life. And he asked for flag authorization to use the flag again because the people needed help. And I said, yes, the people do need help. Um, how, here's the criteria that I need. Number one, that any contract that you're on, I have to be on and I have to proofread. Number two is that you cannot hire anyone because he had shown a uh, position in the past to bring on people that were not qualified for, their, for what he was trying to hire them on as. And so he agreed to that and we continued down the road. So I opened up the Benjamin Franklin Postal Court, the federal postal court, and became chief judge, uh, bringing David aboard as a witness and a federal postal judge as well. And we, we started looking at the procedures of, of syntax again and ordering the courts open and ordering the federal postal court open to hold trial against fraudulent grammar. Unfortunately, a few years later, David's mind started slipping and I noticed it tremendously in 2014, started noticing it in 2014. He couldn't remember dates, he couldn't remember things, and his mind was really slipping. And as from 2014 to 2017, I really was at a loss of words for how to handle him because he was such a good guy, he had such a great message as far as uh, what he was trying to articulate with the grammar. But uh, he couldn't remember anything. And so in 2017, um, I had to court-martial him. In 2018, David Ifewin Colin Miller passed away. And I had to carry on with the corporate structure and to conduct the business that we had set up under our living wills in our corporate entities. For our federal postal court, for our quantum banking system, for all the mechanics that we had placed together to create a better world for the people and grammar. And I complied with those terms within 45 days of his passing. And I was left with the only person with the copyright livery to use the correct grammar on the copyrights for contract. I'd like to give a little closure on the quantum grammar. We use prepositional phrases to certify our facts. We have two verbs, is and are, and it's very complex. Uh, we have correct communication parse syntax grammar, which is a function of breaking down words, looking at order of operations. It's, it's a very complex thing. My, my goal is that the people that are in power, such as the attorneys and the, and the administrative mayors and the mechanical people that control the administrative mechanics of our day-to-day -day lives, use these functions in a way that will downsize and let the people thrive in a way that is beneficial not only for the corporate structures, but beneficial for the people. There are many teachers out there right now, some good, some bad. Those that are teaching correct communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, and teaching the grammar right now need to comply with the corporate structures that have been set up that they use in their day-to-day -day life. If not, they're creating chaos and they don't have the copyright release to be doing such things. As people learn the complexities of the correct communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, that it could be used by the governments of the world to help the people thrive and make them accountable for the things that they do. This will downsize the subjective interpretation of arguing over words. This will also maximize the accountability of the people. Simultaneously maximize the accountability of the governments of the world simultaneously. Obviously, this is going to take quite some time because we're changing out the whole paradigm of the whole world and the style of communication and syntax that we are using as we communicate from country to country, people to people, corporation to corporation. 
We ob obviously need many teachers and many genres to make this flow um, as quick as we can because the world is crumbling around us as we see and we want to we want to support have a support system in place which I have built the constructs for to backstop the financial communities to backstop the financial institutions to backstop the militaries of the world as well as backstop the people for both agriculture and, and to carry out the, the solutions that are out there from the geniuses around the world thank you for your patience if it just takes time, you know, I've been at this 24 years and it, it's taken a, a huge effort. I have, have over 200,000 hours of study time in grammar. And so it just takes a tremendous amount of focus and time. So uh, thank the, I want to thank the people of the world for studying. Thank the people of the world for, for learning about the grammar. And I hope this changes your world in a way to bring much accountability and thriving in your, in your space and in your world. Obviously, as this thing rolls out, uh, you're going to see many pe teachers come forward. I will be giving closure on those teachers that are teaching within the boundaries of the quantum system that's been set up and giving closure of those who have stepped outside the paradigm so we can deal with them and ask them the condition of thinking why they are trespassing upon things that have already been created way before many of them got involved or even learned about this. The wonderful thing about correct communication parsing syntax grammar and quantum grammar is it brings much closure to the words so that the performance and contract terms can be fulfilled and everybody has full closure up front so they know what their duties are within the contract. It also weeds out those who are not performing and, give, and then we can ask the questions on why they're not performing within the terms which they agreed to in the contract. So it's a wonderful tool for the people of the world. It helps businesses and corporations thrive as they move their value or their cargoes from point A to point B. Simultaneously, it allows the citizens of the world to build up their equities and not be uh, manipulated under false terms or a false closure on contracts. I'd like to give a sample on some of the solutions that can be used when you use correct communication parse syntax grammar. When two businesses come into contract together, the business itself is regulated under the law of the flag, which sets the terms for those who come into contract with it. The fee's been paid for the freight, so everybody has joinder in the commerce. Joinder in the commerce means that each party has paid the fee for freight to be, have a position for the statement of a claim. The terms of the contract are done in such a mannerism that all words, or each word in the contract has a definition. And those words have a definition. So it speaks frontwards and backwards. It says the same thing. Therefore, there's not any ambiguity in what words will mean or what the performance of contract terms are. This is a valuable tool for, for honest business. It is also a valuable tool, valuable tool to weed out those that perform and those that don't perform. For as we engage in business and free capital ventures, we should all be performers, right? We should do what we say and say what we mean. The value of the correct communication of parsing syntax grammar is to give the, those who come into contract with that the terms of the performance. That way it's a mutually beneficial for each party. So as we move into the quantum banking system, it weeds out a lot of things that we've seen in the past. Those that steal, those that murder, those that are dishonorable in contract. The quantum banking system pre-position sets the accountability so that we don't have to put up with this anymore. The world need, doesn't need more theft. It doesn't need more strife. It doesn't need more conflict. What we need is solutions. The valuable thing about the grammar is it presets the facts so we can put the solutions on the table so everybody can enjoy it. Everybody can have it. However, there are precautionary methods that have been put in place under the three strike rule that uh, if you use this quantum system and you are a bad person, then things get taken away from you and you get put in time out. What that looks like is you go through the legal system, incorrect communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, where you will get your volition put on trial, your condition of thinking on the facts of why you didn't perform or why you were bad or stealing or killing within the construct of the, of the society. And as you get put into that system, there will be support systems to come behind you once you get to strike one and strike two to really value and take a good look at your life to where you don't get to a strike three scenario 
where people come and help, either through chemistry, either through um, um, nurturing, through behavioral conversations on, you know, upbringing the moral value of righteousness and value behind that. Or if you continue to strike three, we have a thing called voluntary hyphen bankruptcy placed within the construct of the quantum banking system. This is where we come in and seize your assets and put you in timeout for quite some time until you can figure it out. The timeout differs because in that timeout, you will not be given the same accoutrements that you see in the judicial system now. You will be built into, be taught and go to classes to learn how to be righteous and have a behavioral learning so that we can figure out what, was, what you did wrong and so you can learn it for yourself. So that way you place a value on life, you place a value on society, you place a value on honoring people's, their faith, their conditions of who their lives are, and then as you bring that value out and you show that you have that value, then that ethics can now be placed and when we put you back into society and now we bring your assets back under, under your watch under a, a, more of a managed situation so you don't continue to hurt and, and hurt other people. Following the disqualification of the World Health Organization was the disqualification of the Central Disease and Control. Therefore, their capacity to force masks upon people is false and misleading. And the pantomime that's going on through this virus to scare the people into a condition, a state of fear, to say that we can no longer, and to, to psychologically profile the people that they are no longer to help their fellow mankind, but they're to be distant from their fellow mankind. This violates the natural laws of love, caring, joy, and happiness. But when you love and you care and you have joy for your fellow mankind, you make sure that they're closed, you make sure that they're sheltered, you make sure that they have what they need, you make sure that they have solutions of cure, not more of the same. Simultaneously, the scientific war that is going on with the nanobots and the 5G against the people, this is also false and misleading. Because the people are not to be controlled by an artificial simulation because the people were here with their own creativity of their own minds. It is up to the people to create that sovereign energy for themselves, not to be controlled by a scientific wavelength to manipulate their mind or to cause them into a condition of state of fear or hatred or, or the condition of thinking that has been perpetrated through these scientific war machines that have perpetrated our lives. Please make it perfectly clear for the citizens of the world, citizens of the world, Lawsuits in the civil sector will do no good. For well, this is a military operation from the 50s, 60s, and 70s that has been orchestrated to study wavelength technology to manipulate the minds. So this is a this is a military war against the people, a very silent war. This is not a civil war against the people. They have figured out a way to go to war without putting troops on the ground. That's what this is about. It also is about control. It is also about the chemistry of what we put in our bodies and the, and the, chem, and the food and the intake that we are taking. This is all controlled scientifically and there, there are only a very few people that are trying to force their bad, wicked agendas upon we the people. Very soon, we will publish a list of who those people are. Those people are to be found, to be rounded up and to be brought into my location of the now space so I can hold trial against them on the condition of thinking, this is what I do. What is the condition of thinking to create hardship and strife and separation from our fellow mankind? This is false and misleading and some of these questions need to be seriously answered and tough love probably needs to be doled out. This is my job, this is who I am. I tow a very tight line between good and bad in a position of neutrality from the quantum world and a world that does not exist. Contact tracing will not be tolerated in the, within the quantum grammar system. People have the right to be wherever they're at. It is not up to those who think they can police the world because their charters are all fraudulent. Their syntax is all wrong and anything they say will never be used or considered by we the people. 
Therefore, the people have the right to stand up against this technocracy that is approaching them and coming after their day-to-day -day life. There is no quarantine because there is no CDC. There is no contact tracing because there's nothing there to police that. Otherwise, I'd had to have word of it be on my desk with correct grammar. Because the grammar is not correct, there will be no contact tracing, there will be no quarantining, there will be no forced vaccines against the people of the world. The science tech wars of the 5G and the manipulation of subspace and programming subspace will not be tolerated. This is a military operation, not a civilian operation, and those that have done this will be dealt with. The main contract that has kept us in slavery through many centuries has been called the birth certificate. The birth certificate happens when you come out of the water, coming out of your mother's womb, through the water and being docked on this planet they call Earth. As you were docked here, your, the corporate world took control of you by placing you, giving you a birth certificate where your handprints, your thumbprints, your prints hit their contracts first before you hit the land and the system then used that document throughout your whole life to get you, to get into schools to get vaccines to drive to get a social security card to get a passport that contract was used from point a to point b throughout your whole life However, since the system ended in 1999, the good news is, is we have what's called a claim of the life contract. A claim of the life contract gives you sovereignty over yourself, where you have establishment portfolio of when you were docked, and the claims of who your parents are, as well as uh, a fee for freight for the bills of the ladings, which is the postage stamps that are on the contracts themselves. And this contract gives you a function for the statement of a claim which is uh, better than anyone with a birth certificate because someone with a birth certificate, of course, can't state a claim anywhere because that system ended in 1999. So a claim of the life is what the citizens of the world are needing to move themselves out of the birth certificate debt slave system. As the rollout for the quantum banking system happens, there are going to be uh, many chances to get claims of the life. Claims of the life is the first foundation for the statement of a claim to claim your sovereignty and you as a fact on this planet. Thank you for your patience as we this transition of the quantum banking system rolls out and the citizens of the world start using it. It does take time, so I'm busy putting systems together so that it becomes user-friendly for the people. As I create automation, this will aid the citizens of the world. As many of you know, there has been many sacrifices made by me and others in the quantum system that have been there as a foundation. The goal here is that most of you and many of you will not have to go through the same hardships as I did because the, the system itself will be in place so that the people don't have to suffer, that the transition into the quantum system is smooth, where we safeguard your assets and you safeguard your things. This, please keep in mind, this is not a get out of jail free card. This is accountability for yourselves and accountability for those who use the system. For those of you that are still engaged in the fiction system that does not have authorization, it's time for you to step out of the way. Now is the time to stand up for our rights, to learn how to communicate in the correct grammar so we can end all the wars and communicate peacefully with our fellow mankind. <laughs>